Hello, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. Here we're going to take a look at video J on the urinary system, which is a follow-up on the regulation of glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, in the kidneys. We've already looked at intrinsic regulation, which we can also think of as autoregulation. In this video we're going to focus on the extrinsic regulatory mechanisms, which include hormones and the nervous system, or spe specifically the sympathetic nervous system. What sets the extrinsic control mechanisms separate from the intrins intrinsic control mechanisms that regulate GFR in the kidneys is that both the sympathetic nervous system and the hormones the way that they regulate GFR is by doing it indirectly. They first will fix our systemic blood pressure. So notice what it says here in this last bullet, the main thrust of extrinsic controls is to regulate systemic blood pressure. And as they do that, then that allows for our GFR to be adjusted as well. So it's an indirect way of adjusting our GFR. Now when does or when do the extrinsic mechanisms kick in? Well clearly you know by now that the sympathetic nervous system is going to kick in during times of stress. Particularly we're going to take a look at times when perhaps a patient is bleeding out to the point that they're going into hypovolemic shock. So during these stressful time periods your sympathetic nervous system is going to go through um, vasoconstriction of many arterioles, but in such a way to where the blood towards very vital organs during times of stress, blood flow in those areas is maintained or even increased, such as the skeletal muscles, the heart muscle, and of course the brain, which is doing anything and everything it can to maintain good consistent blood flow. So this is not the time for us to be filtering our blood and cranking out urine. It's also not the time for us to be digesting our food. And so consequently we may see, we may see such severe vasoconstriction, particularly in the afferent arterioles, that filtration becomes very inhibited in the kidneys to the point that we might actually see the filtration stop. Now, the sympathetic nervous system can do that by, by directly releasing its neurotransmitters um, onto the arteriolar smooth muscle cells um, that are going to respond to these neurotransmitters by um, vasoconstricting or the sympathetic nervous system can also trigger the whole hormonal mechanism. And of course that hormonal mechanism is the famous RAA mechanism or the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanisms. We in the past have referred to it as the RAA mechanism. And so we will study that in uh, great detail here momentarily. Let's first of all acquaint ourselves with the components of the RAA mechanism. Remember the R stands for renin and the renin is actually produced by the juxtaglomerular cells which are these smooth muscles right, cells right here in the afferent arteriole and these smooth muscle cells contain granules with renin inside of them. So that's what the R stands for. The second letter, the letter A, stands for angiotensin II, and we will see here momentarily how we end up with angiotensin II in the blood. Then our second letter A stands for aldosterone, which is a hormone produced by the adrenal medulla. Some people call it just the RA mechanism, and in, uh, in my opinion we could even call it the RAA a mechanism, adding a third letter A, because we'll see that ADH plays a role as well. So the RAA mechanism is going to kick in when our patient is suffering from low blood pressure. And, and remember, these are hormones, or this is a hormonal mechanism, that 
therefore is going to work and respond much slower than our sympathetic nervous system. So this is more of a long-term and slower response to perhaps more of a systemic or a um, slowly dropping blood pressure or a uh, chronic form of, of threatening low blood pressure. <clears throat> So let's get started here with looking at the RAA, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, juxtaglomerular apparatus. Remember that's an apparatus made up by our macula densa cells that are located in the distal convoluted tubule that touches onto the glomerulus area, but particularly the afferent arterial, which we see right here. And in this particular area of the afferent arterial, we see some cells, smooth muscle cells that have become specialized in storing little granules that are uh, renin granules. And these juxtaglomerular cells are very responsive to whether this afferent arterial is being stretched or not stretched, clearly representing whether there is uh, an increase or a decrease in blood pressure. Our macula densa cells are going to pl play a role in this RAA mechanism, and this may not make a whole lot of sense quite yet, but it will as I continue with our discussion of uh, regulation of glomerular filtration rate. But remember their responsibility, their osmoreceptors, chemoreceptors, and when blood pressure is dropping, there, that means that less filtrate is formed. So the filtrate present in this distal convoluted tubule right here, so let me make this clear, this is your distal convoluted tubule right there. That filtrate flows pretty slowly at this point in time, so there's a drop in filtrate flow. And because um, there is such a flow, slow flow, it means that way too much of the solutes were probably reabsorbed into the blood, which ends up meaning that we end up with a low solute concentration, particularly sodium concentration in the distal convoluted tubule. All of this plays a role in the kidneys responding to our low or dropping blood pressure. The juxtaglomerular cells detect there is a drop in blood pressure, they're not being stretched, and consequently they release renin into the bloodstream. So here we see that our kidney cells, more specifically these juxtaglomerular cells, dump this hormone into the bloodstream. And this hormone is now going to act as an enzyme. And how does it do that? Well, the liver produces a protein called angiotensinogen, which is an inactive form of a protein that requires renin to be converted, to convert, I should say, the angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. So now we see how renin is acting as an enzyme. Angiotensin 1 is still not quite active yet and needs yet another enzyme reaction to become angiotensin II, our final product. And that conversion from one to two requires ACE, which is an enzyme we learned about in the respiratory system when you learn about the different functions of the cells that are present inside of the alveoli. So your type one cells can produce the angiotensin converting enzyme called ACE. So here we are with angiotensin II, and this really gets, gets our RAA mechanism going. Angiotensin II has many roles, and not all of them are listed here. Some of the major ones are listed here. For one, it's going to function as a very systemic vasoconstrictor such that you know, many of our precapillary sphincters are going to be constricting even uh, systemic vasoconstriction within the arterioles. And this is going to help with the diversion of the blood away from the kidneys, away from the digestive structures. Uh, basically, those parts of our body that at this point in time are not requiring or needing that much blood. And we're making sure that enough blood go to the vital organs, the heart, the brain, um, and perhaps the skeletal muscles. At the same time, angiotensin II is going to trigger the release of two hormones. It's going to trigger the release of um, aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. And I just realized that I might have said adrenal medulla earlier. I meant to say the adrenal cortex. The adrenal medulla releases norepinephrine and epinephrine. 
So the adrenal cortex releases aldosterone and this steroid hormone is then going to bind to the, the renal tubules of the nephrons and trigger these uh, renal tubules to reabsorb sodium from the filtrate to therefore hope to bring up the um, blood volume because as sodium is reabsorbed, we're going to see that more water follows. And as, as we bring up blood volume, so we bring, we bring up blood volume, as you know, that's going to bring up our blood pressure. And if we bring up blood pressure, that means that we also are going to, sorry, um, increase our glomerular filtration rate. Similar principle with the angiotensin II that was formed uh, triggering the release of ADH. ADH is a hormone that can bind to cells of the distal convoluted tubules, for instance, and the collecting ducts, and trigger those cells to, buy, to build little protein channels, uh, little, I'm sorry, water channels called aquaporins. And with the help of those aquaporins, water will now be able to move across the uh, collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule wall. Without the binding of ADH, water cannot move along its concentration gradient. So bear in mind that water will always only move along its own concentration gradient um, via osmosis. Okay. Now, let's add a couple more things. First of all, since we're talking here about ADH, remember that ADH is also called, especially in clinical settings, vasopressin, or translated vessel for vaso and pressin referring to temperature. And therefore, it tells you that this is also another hormone that is going to help with the... Um, systemic vasoconstriction in the body. Actually, it's a pretty potent vasoconstrictor. Not only that, not only should we add that about ADH, angiotensin II also has something interesting going on. So actually, let's use a different color to point that out. Let's use blue here for angiotensin II because it has many receptors located on the efferent arterioles, more so than the afferent arterioles. And if that and that then causes vasoconstriction of the efferent arterioles. Now if you think about that, what will that do to the the blood uh, in the glomeruli? Well if we have the, the the shrinking of the diameter of the efferent arterioles clearly the blood in the glomerulus is going to back up and that is going to lead to more filtration. And so this is a more direct way to increase the glomerular filtration rate. So in this sense, angiotensin II has more of a direct mechanism to impact GFR without going through the mechanism of increasing blood volume or systemic blood pressure. Finally, we should also add that angiotensin II can increase our, or can trigger, I should say, our thirst center. So let's add that. So it can activate the thirst center. And of course, that's also located in the brain along with the pituitary gland, which of course is responsible for secreting ADH. So when we activate the thirst center in the hypothalamus, we're going to drink more, and as we drink more, we're going to increase our um, blood volume, and by now you know that increases our blood pressure. So what is important for you to recognize is that there are so many organs involved in regulating our blood pressure. The obvious one being the kidneys, right? And then we see the liver, the lungs. We've mentioned that aldosterone is produced by the adrenal gland, more specifically, which you see right here, most, more specifically the adrenal cortex, the outer layer of the adrenal gland. 
we, we see that ADH is produced by the posterior pituitary gland, which dangles off our hypothalamus. So we see the brain involved plus a major endocrine gland. So lots of different structures very involved in regulating uh, systemic blood pressure and therefore also glomerular filtration rate. So in summary, the RAA mechanism is going to try to maintain the systemic blood pressure and by doing that, it can actually impact GFR. So it is going to always kick in if the systemic blood pressure is too low, which typically means that our GFR is too low and too low meaning below that range you learned about between 80 and 180. So it's the juxtaglomerular cells that detect that the walls of the afferent arteriole are not stretched. That triggers them to release the renin, which ultimately leads to the production of angiotensin II, our potent systemic vasoconstrictor, which of course increases our systemic blood pressure, or mean, we can also uh, use the term mean arterial pressure. It's going to trigger the release of aldosterone and ADH, which both are going to increase blood volume. Maybe here too we should add that we're going to increase our thirst or activate our thirst center, which will increase blood volume once again. I'll just draw an arrow to over there, which leads to an increase in um, MAP. And then let's not forget that we talked about how there are many more Receptor for, receptors for angiotensin II on the efferent arterioles such that they can go through vasoconstriction and therefore directly impact G, uh, GFR in the kidneys. Okay, another one of my little flow charts and I am again adding a little bit more information. Again, there's a, quite a bit of a review here of what we've done, but we're going to add the influence of the macula densa cells when it comes to the RAA mechanism as well. So, if systemic blood pressure drops, that typically leads to a drop in our GFR. And again, that's the focus, right? How do the kidneys fix their GFR? They can depend on intrinsic mechanisms, which they do, you know, from minute to minute, but at times that's not enough particularly under severe stress when the sympathetic nervous system has to kick in. And at times we see that um, the RAA mechanism has to help out as well. So if autoregulation is just not enough, we can either see that the sympathetic nervous system kicks in because after all, if the systemic blood pressure drops, the baroreceptors are not stretched, you know, your cardiovascular centers kick in, or don't, depending on which one, um, but especially our uh, vasomotor center is going to play a role in um, stimulating our sympathetic fibers to release norepinephrine. The release of norepinephrine is going to cause um, systemic-wide vasoconstriction, true, but we're looking here more at um, our RAA mechanism. Notice that your sympathetic fibers that release norepinephrine can directly interact with the jugular, the juxtaglomerular cells to secrete renin. So here we see an additional piece of information, the direct connection, or I should say interaction between the release of norepinephrine by the sympathetic fibers and the JG cells. So hold that thought. So not only are we going to see the impact of our sympathetic nervous system, our, we can also take a look at the JG cells themselves and how they respond to a drop in blood pressure. Clearly they're not stretched. That triggers them to release renin as well. So we have learned that before already. One more piece of new information, and that is the influence of the macula densa cells. The macula densa cells, when they detect that low filtrate flow, they detect a low amount of sodium because the blood pressure has been dropping and the glomerular filtration rate is dropping. The macula densa cells detect that and they also can communicate directly with the JG cells and trigger them to release renin. 
And so um, once we have angiotensin 2, there's a whole slew of impacts. But if we want to see the impact on the GFR directly, remember that the efferent arterioles have many more receptors for angiotensin 2. And they can now constrict such that we have um, more resistance and a back pressure in the glomerulus, so its hydrostatic pressure goes up and its GFR goes up. We can take this further and assume that there's an extreme drop in blood pressure. Perhaps your patient is bleeding out. So once again, our sympathetic nervous system kicks in and releases its neurotransmitters, uh, creating you know, systemic vasoconstriction, which, as you know by now, is going to bring up our um, blood pressure. But keep in mind that the vasoconstriction can become so severe that the arterial leading the blood into the glomerulus becomes so constricted that really there's not enough <clears throat> excuse me, hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus to allow for, for filtration to occur, and it might stop altogether. Now, this should happen, right, in a severe, stressful situation where our blood pressure is crashing. There's no need now for our kidneys to be working uh, so hard, and so they are literally inhibited. At the same time, our sympathetic fibers can also communicate with the JG cells directly and have them secrete renin, and that leads to angiotensin II, and that in turn, again, leads to this systemic vasoconstriction. Once we have angiotensin II, we, might see, we will see the release of aldosterone, ADH, thirst center. All of them are going to increase blood, blood volume, which then raises blood pressure, and as a side product, that could raise GFR, again, unless there is such a severe vasoconstriction throughout the body, and particularly the kidneys, that GFR will literally stop. Finally, notice that if our GFR drops so far, our MD cells, um, or I should say, continues to drop our macula densa cells, they themselves too can communicate with our JG cells to release renin and therefore uh, create more angiotensin too. So to summarize, what are the main triggers for the release of renin? First of all, the macula densa cells can detect if the filtrate flow or the sodium concentration is low in the distal convoluted tubule. And when it is, they can stimulate the juxtaglomerular cells to release renin, right? That's their job. So the macula densa cells can interact with the JG cells. What else can interact with the JG cells? Well, the sympathetic fibers directly can directly um, impact the JG cells by releasing norepinephrine. So clearly there must be receptors for norepinephrine on the JG cells, and they, they are adrenergic receptors, more specifically beta adrenergic receptors. So that's another way. Um, the JG cells are going to release renin themselves without being stimulated by the nervous system or any kind of a hormone because they are not stretched themselves. So that also triggers them to release renin. And then angiotensin II can actually feed back to the JG cells to trigger them to release renin. So notice that each time you see a new slide, there's a, a, a small new piece of information, maybe sometimes a couple of new pieces of information. But we're going to put this all together in a major flow chart um, so that nothing is going to be left out um, and you can interconnect everything that you just learned and not have any kind of gaps in your knowledge. So no worries there. So that's going to be in the next video, a big overview of everything you've learned about regulation of GFR in the body.